Christianity Today did something really different. They allowed a non-Christian to publish a piece in here That's with advice choice. for Christians. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting. I appreciate that they're willing to, to reach out and look for different angles like that. Yeah, and because here's the thing. We shouldn't be scared of ideas and suggestions. Mm -hmm. And also, how are we going to know what we look like to other people if other people don't tell us? Exactly. So here's how this one goes. Starts this way. Consider this a dispatch from my neighborhood to yours. Christianity Today doesn't typically publish Orthodox Jewish writers, so you might consider me a distant cousin, writing in an effort to understand and encourage American evangelicals as they adjust to a dominant culture that's increasingly postmodern and even pagan. While Jews see this era as but another chapter in a long journey, many American evangelicals seem to have lost their ballast and with it the cohesion and vision necessary to flourish as a minority. Hmm. What, can be, uh, what can this distant cousin offer? Let me take you on a tour of my community. Anchored by the rules of Shabbat, we live one day a week, plus major holidays, as if we were, as one visiting pastor friend remarked, from the 1950s, before automobiles, television, and apps came to dominate daily life. I think he's wrong about cars, but... We'll skip that part. Yeah. People drove in the 50s, but mm -hmm. I know what he means. You didn't drive much on Sundays. There it is. Although a Sunday drive was a thing, and some, I still don't get, I'd ask my dad about that. So you, you just got in the car and you drove. Right. Where were you going? We didn't know. That sounds kind of nice. Yeah, Dana you likes get to on do a, that now. On a back rural ish road, mm -hmm. put the music up. It's a lot of fun. Just turn wherever you want. Sounds great. Okay. Um, <laughs> streets fill with people walking, he says, to a neighbor's house, a park, a prayer service, a celebration. And we encounter many familiar faces and get caught up in conversation along the way. Weekly life is sustained day in and day out by a strong set of place-based institutions working in tandem. Schools, synagogues, restaurants, charities, and interfamily networks together creating a string of close-knit communities across the country. He said, how is this different from what CT readers most likely observe and experience in their daily rhythms? Well, socialized to believe that their culture was the majority, it seems Christians have invested much less than Orthodox Jews in four key elements of faithful living required to thrive as a minority. So he's essentially saying there's four keys to how we can successfully live as a, as a minority for, I don't know, forever, <laughs> for all of mm -hmm. world history, and why you're struggling. Mm-hmm. Now, before I get to those, he says this, from my vantage point, it appears that American Christians in general and evangelicals in particular are perplexed as to how to handle a world in which they are but a minority. Nationally, many Christians are trying to reshape the majority culture and political landscape as if their own future depended on it, creating a backlash against the faith that makes sustaining and enlarging it even harder. Fair assessment okay. from an Orthodox Jewish man? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does that resonate with you? I think most of us, you know, boomers on up, we've grown up with America being the number one superpower in the world and Christianity being the dominant uh, religious affiliation, at least in, in name, for America. Mm -hmm. So we've... We've had that viewpoint that, you know, we can we can do anything because we're Americans and God is for us. Well, that's changing. America, you know, is still the dominant superpower in the world. Occasionally you get some flexings from other countries, but they, they kind of come and go. Um, but the Christianity is becoming less and less a, a thriving uh, community, at least by name. You know, people are more and more saying, no, I I have no religious affiliation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really comforting and sobering for a, a Jewish man to be saying, hey, remember where your, where your help comes from, where your hope and your joy comes from. I mean, we complain that we're a minority and we're over oh, being persecuted. You, you talk about a historically persecuted group, the yeah. Jews. <laughs> right. And they're still around. Oh, yeah. And they've they've thrived in many different types of society. Right. Mm -hmm. So he thinks he's got a recipe for this. Now, I, I will say I find it interesting at our men's conference this last year. We did a panel together. Remember, all of us went up there um, and we did kind of a version of the show. Mm -hmm. One of the conversations we had was 
the idea that Ed Stetzer said back in like 2012 that mm-hmm. we lost the culture war. That was a controversial thing for us to talk about. Mm. Like there was a significant number of people in the audience that were just not so sure we've lost the culture war. And now we have an Orthodox Jewish guy going like, hey, you guys, you, you get it yet? <laughs> you get it? You're a minority like us. Mm-hmm. Come on over. We'll, we got, we'll, we'll help you figure this out. Or not. <laughs> He's saying that we're creating a backlash against the Christian faith that makes sustaining and enlarging it even harder as we fight to try to make the majority agree with us when we actually are not the majority. Mm. He's saying it's obvious. Yeah. We don't see it. We're too close. Many of us. Yeah. I don't And I think what's interesting, historically speaking as well, is when you look at, like, for example, One Nation Under God, that part of the Pledge of Allegiance Mm -hmm. was added in like the 1950s by Dwight Eisenhower and his administration. And part of that was a direct response to the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And the rise of communism. Yeah, because communism was distinctively atheist. Right. And so one of the ways we, like, forced ourselves to identify is how opposite we were of atheists mm-hmm. was by ingraining our theism into our country, into our like motto, you know, yeah. in God we trust and all that stuff. I'm not saying that uh, it wasn't sincere, but it wasn't necessarily born out of a revival from the great mm-hmm. awakening of people wanting to turn to Jesus. Mm-hmm. We're just going like, oh yeah, you guys are atheists? Well, we're not. <laughs> it's kind of like playground one upmanship almost. <laughs> it is. And should we be surprised that once the Soviet Union collapses in like 91 and society kind of drifts looking for who's going to be the bad guy in movies now? We still spent another 10 years after that making that like the remnants of the Russians were still after us. Right. <laughs> but um, like as we no longer had to distinguish ourselves, it seems like people just stopped caring about it. I think the stop caring probably started even before the Cold War ended. I mean, you can just see how yeah. culture shifted starting in probably the 60s or the 70s. Mm-hmm. And slowly drifted. Now, um, he says he's got four key elements, this Orthodox Jewish writer for Christianity Today, four key elements of faithful living that are required to thrive as a minority. I'm going to give them to you, and then we'll dig into what they are here after a quick break. They are, number one, educating children separately from the broader society. Number two, Marking space and time to bolster community cohesion. Number three, strengthening local institutions. And number four, reducing the influence of secular media. Christianity Today published an article written by an Orthodox Jewish man who's saying, listen, evangelicals, it seems like you're struggling to adapt to a culture in which you're the minority. Mm -hmm. Let me offer you some advice from us, the Orthodox Jewish community, who has survived for thousands of years. <laughs> right. Uh, now, just because he's giving advice doesn't mean we have to like all of it. And this is what I want to do is analyze his advice. True. He's essentially saying Christians ought to create their own version of insulated Orthodox Jewish community. That's what he's saying. Mm, okay. Be just like us. So let's look at at his four points one at a time. If you missed it, again, he's saying there's four key elements of faithful living required to thrive as a minority in culture. Here we go. The first one, he says, educate children separately from the broader society and make that learning a lifelong part of the faith. So he said, Jews are famous for our focus on learning. We are, after all, the people of the book, and learning Torah is the central element of our faith. But there's another rarely stated reason religious education is so important to us. Historically, only Jews who emphasized learning in Jewish schools and absorbing Jewish ideas were able to transmit their identity to subsequent generations. Everyone who did not do so assimilated. As such, religious Jews build schools everywhere we go, uh, take on enormous hardship due to, uh, to ensure that our children only go to such institutions. Public schools are not an option, he says. And while some homeschool, most Jews believe that communal education settings inculcate values and knowledge that could not be replicated otherwise. Okay. So he's saying one of the keys to thriving as a minority is public school cannot be an option for you. Homeschooling isn't the best move. You have to, at great personal and community sacrifice, create religious institution-based schools. So that you can teach your kids religion and 
other types of learning. This is, I, I saw that, and you can't just read that and go, oh, great idea. That's a controversial idea. Yes, it is. What do we make of this? Is he right? Is this the way Christians ought to do it? We ought to make our own schools where we go to our schools, and that's it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a private Christian education. I think that's a great option for many families, but I don't think we should silo ourselves either because mm-hmm. we are called to go out into the world so that we can make disciples. Amen. That's what I was th- I was thinking of that Great Commission, right, and going, how do we fulfill the Great Commission if we take his advice and essentially become a new kind of Orthodox Jewish community where essentially we're going to dress different than you, we're going to live together, and we're, you, you can come and hang out, but we're about us. Yeah, and their, their directives do not include anything like the Great Commission. No, they, they do not, not at all. I mean, they're certainly welcoming of strangers and such, but it's not an evangelistic religion. Right. Am I getting that right, Lauren, or Moody grad? Yeah, that was the first thing I thought of is, well, they don't have the same calling to go and make disciples like we do. They're not worried if people convert to Judaism or not. Because they're also a race. Right. So their way mm-hmm. of getting, you know, ha- having more people into the faith is by having children. Right. So they're not worried about if people are coming to the faith, their faith or not, where we are. And we should be because we're called to do that. Um, I also then worry about if all the Christians leave public schools, who's there? If there's no yeah. Christian influence in public schools or Christian families in public schools or Christian teachers in public schools, then where do they have, you know, influence? And also, mm-hmm. you can say that you can't complain about culture anymore then because you've left it. You can't right. complain at all about what the culture is doing or how it's, you know, against God or how you hate it or whatever because you've left. Right. So it kind of takes away your voice to have any commentary about what's happening in the world, in my opinion. Now, you've said before that you and Eddie want to send your kids to public school. Yeah. Um, Why would you want to do that? Because somebody could say to you, I mean, why risk that with your small children? Maybe send them to public school in high school once they've had a firm foundation in their Christian faith, either homeschooling or private Christian school. Well, first of all, high school is the worst time to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Completely introduced to new peers having not been there before. Yeah. um, I think for us, both uh, Eddie, my husband, and I went to Christian schools growing up. And we find great value in our sons being exposed to the things that are happening around them in the world. And then to be able to have the conversations at home of what we believe and why we believe it. And so that they can go back into their schools and influence their friends. Of why are they different? And why do they do things differently? Instead of just keeping them in like-mindedness, I would prefer that we're able to have hard conversations at home and to be able to work out those things while they're still under my influence in my home so that it can go then send them out and they're not shocked by what they see when they're 21. Right. Yeah. I... I appreciate this gentleman's advice Mm -hmm. and the strategy used by the Orthodox Jewish community has certainly worked to preserve culture. Again, I just think it's important for us to critically analyze it as he sets forth his four. Let's go to the second one. He's got, again, four ideas on how we can thrive as a minority in American culture or any culture. He said, second, mark space and time in ways that can sustain culture, values, rituals, and identity. He said, education is only a start if minority identity instead of beliefs are to be transmitted generation to generation. We must deliberately develop for our community, and especially our youth, an independent culture backed by its own history and narrative and instilling a sense of quiet strength and belief in the ultimate vindication of our beliefs. Engagement and even partial integration with mainstream society is permissible, but it should be done in ways that do not undermine our community's values and cohesion. Practically speaking, it is okay to live in a city, go to a secular college, and work for a big company, as long as you live and mainly socialize with your own community. It is essential to observe Sabbath and major holidays. Don't we already live by the Christian calendar? Right, but he's saying essentially you can go out and make a living in society, but create an insulated community that you go Mm -hmm. back to that preserves your values. And again, I think completely siloing yourself and your fellow believers is completely contradictory to what Scripture tells us to do. Yeah. I get why it works for the Orthodox Jewish community. Right. 
I actually respect how they've managed to do this for so many years. But yeah, I, I don't know if he totally understands the call of the Christian life. Like, how do you love your enemy if you don't spend any time near them other than at the office, I guess? I don't know. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's almost like creating little communes of sort. Mm-hmm. I liked the line about taking part in society, but not so much as it undermines, like, your values. I would agree with that. Your values as a Christian should be priority over whatever is happening in culture. But I don't think that means siloing yourself, like Daria said. Yeah, you know, in our church this last Sunday, um, a great message from one of our elders, John, he's a great speaker. He talked about a passage in Romans where it talks about you shouldn't get into arguments about things that are not, Mm. you know, essential. Mm -hmm. Don't get all these useless divisions. Now, when you look at New Testament Christianity, right, it releases us from a whole bunch of the rules Mm -hmm. and laws of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, like, how would you create an isolated Christian community? The, The core connectivity would be the essential doctrine of the Christian faith, like part of the creeds. But outside of that, I mean, they've got rules for what, when you can do this and that, what and what eat, you what eat, wear. and what you wear. Mm-hmm. We don't have those rules. Mm-hmm. How could how, could we even do it? It'd be a big community. It wouldn't be as I think niche as the Orthodox Jewish. Or would it community. be a whole bunch of even smaller ones? Because there'd be some who'd be like, "Well, you certainly can't sure. have drums in church. What would you yeah. do that for?" And then these ones, you can't wear leggings. And then, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and that... I mean, having this close knit community is not a bad idea. We are way too independent. We just talked about this. Last week, our communities are spread out. Our families are spread out. This is not a bad idea in principle. I think where it becomes a problem is when he's insinuating that you become exclusionary. Mm. Yeah. Like it, I think we can create this within our church communities where we spend lots of time together. But I, I just don't know if it's fully transferable. Let's go to the third point quickly here. He says, third, in order to thrive as a minority in culture, you must establish a dense network of local institutions to support individual communities, as well as the broader diaspora, uh, or for you, the global church. So he says, when you live in small communities that must survive without the help of, and in sometimes in opposition to the government, you must quickly develop new mechanisms to support yourself. These various social institutions, some formally established, many operating ad hoc or in the margins of smaller communities, play crucial roles not only in helping people, but also in bonding them together in a way that builds social cohesion, identity, and resilience. Like, for example, one of them is um, uh, Gemachem, which is a, f- a free loan fund. And mm-hmm. I've seen the Amish actually do this as well, where mm-hmm. you actually pool your resources to create interest-free loans for your community. Mm-hmm. And it does generate wealth. He's saying you need to create some community-centric things that your group gets to be a part of because they're part of your group. Mm-hmm. Yeah? It, it's carried out for us in churches. We don't live in this, you know, particular same neighborhoods and stuff, but in the same greater area, um, you know, 90% of churches are 200 people or less, right. and they tend to be in that general neighborhood. So, yeah, we get together and we, maybe you do a, um, the men who are automotively capable will hold a clinic and, you know, typically single moms bring their car in and they have that worked on and things done for them that, you know, that they couldn't afford or had no idea how to do. Um, There's, you know, work projects that go on. There's uh, women tend to make the meal trains when somebody's had a loss in the family or uh, an injury or something where they're laid up. Boom, the women are there constantly. So we we do have that sense of community. Um, and we do create somewhat, and they're not institutions, but we create systems to support people within our congregations. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of those too, right, we designed for the good of the community around us that's not part of our group. When you were hungry, you you gave. When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I don't think he was referring to just people in your church. And to Ron's point too, I would argue most people don't have that. Like that is the goal. That is what the church is supposed to be. Mm-hmm. But so many people, we talked about this a lot recently. They just come in, they put in their two hours on a Sunday, and they leave. They don't know anybody. They're not actually in a community. They're just they're their butts in the seat. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, there's one more point. Perhaps we can get to this on Friday. He has. Um, I I appreciate the gesture of it, saying, "Listen, you, <laughs> we're not going around trying to make the entire country Orthodox Jewish." He says he's almost like you're wasting your breath and your time trying to make the whole country Christian. Figure out how to thrive as a minority. And I think that admonition's good. I'm not mm -hmm. certain his advice is super helpful. <laughs> I wish it were more helpful. It's just my analysis of it. There are lots of good pieces in there that I think we yes. can glean from. Yes, there's, uh, there's thoughts, there's pieces. It's not perfectly transferable. But the concept of learning how to thrive as a minority, yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. I think we, could, we, we would actually do well to put our energy to that.